Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akashrafi. Today is November 9th, 2021, and I'm speaking with Emily Merchant, who is a historian of science and technology at UC Davis, and she is the author of Building the Population Bomb. Thank you for joining us, Emily. Thank you for having me. In your book, you examine the 100-year history of our understandings and perceptions of the problem of human population. What were the dominant views about population growth at the start of the 20th century? So going into the 20th century, there were two perspectives on population growth that were really quite comfortable with one another. So the older one, demographers refer to this as a mercantilist perspective on population growth, which is the idea that population growth is really the source of economic dynamism and geopolitical strength for a country. And in the beginning of the 19th century, Thomas Robert Malthus suggested that population growth would exhaust a country's natural resources. So population growth starts to seem dangerous in the sense that it can produce poverty, misery, famine, things like that. But really, throughout the the 19th century, these two views of population coexisted quite comfortably with one another. In general, the Malthusian view was kind of applied at the family level. So the idea that families with too many kids would be more likely to be poor, while the mercantilist view kind of prevailed at the national level. So even though there was this idea that at the family level, too much reproduction could cause poverty, at the national level, countries were still promoting population growth. So those were kind of the two views of population going into the 20th century. Part of your history is that scientists started counting and calculating and later modeling and simulating populations. So what did scientists find when they started counting and calculating the population? So in the 1920s in the United States, you see two groups of scientists starting to count population in ways that allowed them to kind of systematically model population change in the future. And one group of scientists uh, were natural scientists, mostly biologists, and they focused on aggregate growth rates. So how much is population growing from year to year in the aggregate? And in the 1920s, aggregate growth rates in the United States were quite high. And these calculations kind of reinforced their Malthusian view of population. So for these scientists, population was growing very quickly and very quickly reaching the natural limits of either the United States when they took a national perspective or the world when they took a global perspective. There was another group of scientists and these were statisticians. And at the time, these particular statisticians worked at the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. So these are people who work with data, with large quantities of data about people. And these statisticians, instead of looking at aggregate growth rates, they looked at age-specific birth and death rates. So how many births are occurring among women of a certain age, or how many deaths are occurring at each age. And when they calculated these age-specific rates, it appeared to them that population growth was slowing and would soon level off or even reverse course. And they were looking specifically at the national level, so at the United States. So it appeared through these particular types of calculations that U.S. population growth was slowing and that it would soon even begin to decline. And these statisticians took um, the mercantilist view of population. So for them, this population decline was itself a problem, mainly because populations in other countries were growing more rapidly. So they were particularly concerned about Eastern Europe and also about India and Japan, uh, less so China. And so these two groups of scientists were taking really the same data, but analyzing it in different ways. One way which uh, reinforced kind of Malthusian ideas about population growing out of control, and the other way which reinforced mercantilist fears about the U.S. population not growing rapidly enough to um, provide it with potential military power or economic um, growth. And remember, this is now by the time that these debates are occurring between these two groups of scientists, we're now in the 1930s. And so declining population growth is now also becoming an explanation for the Great Depression. 
And these two groups of population analysts, they, they both agreed on, on eugenics. Eugenics was widely popular at this time. So they both agreed that you know, some people should re- be reproducing more and some people should be reproducing less. Where they really clashed with one another was over immigration. So the, the Malthusians pointed to rapid population growth as a reason to restrict immigration to the United States. And the, the mercantilists, the statisticians, pointed to slowing population growth as a reason not to restrict immigration to the United States. After World War II, with the end of global empires, the rise of many new nation states and international organizations, how did these international organizations study and understand population around the world and globally? After World War II, it pretty quickly became clear to observers in the United States that population was growing rapidly in the global south. It was growing in the north as well as a result of the baby boom, but something different was happening in the global south, which was that uh, mortality rates were going down pretty dramatically. Fertility rates were staying approximately the same. And so as a result of fewer deaths with the same number of births, population was growing pretty rapidly. And the the two groups of scientists that I was talking about before, the natural scientists with their Malthusian perspective and the statisticians with their mercantilist perspective, again, took somewhat different approaches to understanding the the causes and consequences of post-war population growth. So I'll start with the, the Malthusians. And this perspective really had been popular among natural scientists before World War II, that that remained the case, but it was also adopted by American businessmen and philanthropists in the wake of, of World War II. And these businessmen were very worried about population growth in the global south, primarily because despite their Malthusian perspective, they they still did also see population growth as a source of um, political power for decolonizing states. And and they worried that population growth would affect the access of American corporations to raw materials, labor, and markets in the global south. So there's a fear that population growth in um, the global south is going to be bad for American business. And these businessmen expressed this fear in Malthusian terms. So they described population growth really as a source of food shortage, which would lead to war. And also, it's right after World War II that people in this kind of group of Americans start to present population growth as a danger to the natural environment. So, you know, it's becoming clear that, that humans depend on the natural environment not just for their livelihoods through raw materials, but also for life. And these Malthusians are starting to to present population growth as a threat to the natural environment. Now, the statisticians who I was talking about before with the mercantilist approach to population, it's this group that in the 1930s starts to identify as demographers. So social scientists begin to join this group and they develop a professional identity as demographers. And during World War II, American demographers were asked by the League of Nations and by the US government to predict population growth worldwide over the next several decades. And in order to you know, kind of predict the future, which is by definition unknown, they needed to develop a, a theoretical approach to thinking about how populations grow. And so what they did was they looked at the the history of England and universalized it. So they theorized that every society would undergo a process of modernization and that that process would have demographic consequences, predictable demographic consequences. So first, death rates would would decline dramatically as access to food became more reliable. Um, With sanitation, death rates would go down. And then later on, as death rates went down, parents didn't have to worry as much about infant mortality, but also as societies developed to replace kind of family-based institutions with other kinds of social institutions, that people would have fewer children. And so the result would be a demographic balance between low death rates and low birth rates. 
And so this was what demographers kind of expected to see unfolding worldwide. And after World War II, it appeared that in, in many parts of the global south, that the first part of this demographic transition was happening, um, but the second part wasn't. And demographers initially attributed that kind of stalling of the demographic transition to imperialism, to economic domination of the global south by the global north. And they didn't get a whole lot of buy-in from the, the philanthropists who funded their work. And that's because the philanthropists were taking the, the Malthusian view, which is that population growth anywhere is, is a direct threat to American business and national security. And by the end of the 1940s, we start to see this kind of convergence between, or a consensus, as I call it in the book, uh, between this very expansive Malthusian fear of population growth as really growing kind of beyond the limits of what the world can bear, what the, what the natural earth can bear. Uh, we see a convergence between that view and the much more um, limited concern about population growth among demographers, which is focused on um, economic development in the global south. And demographers really started to see population growth itself as a barrier to economic development. And so we have, on the one hand, a very expansive Malthusian worry about population growth anywhere and everywhere, and, uh, and then a much more targeted concern among demographers about population growth, particularly in the global south. And what happened is that uh, the, these two, two perspectives start to, in the um, in the 1950s and 1960s started to support one another. So the, the more limited but scientific understanding of demographers provided scientific legitimacy to the more expansive view of the businessmen and philanthropists. And the businessmen and philanthropists were much louder about their perspectives on population, which provided public support to demographers' concerns about population growth as a barrier to economic development. How did this emerging consensus play out in public discussions or public understandings of population? So that's a really good question. And what what I found is that demographers and, and their supporters, so very quickly um, in the 1950s, uh, a new organization was established called um, the Population Council. And the Population Council was established by uh, John D. Rockefeller III, who was then chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation. And he established the Population Council in coordination with Frank Notstein, who was at the time just about the most prominent demographer in the United States. And the Population Council provided funding to demography and, and really saw demography as kind of a lever with which to promote um, population control overseas. But the, the Population Council was very worried about public opinion in the United States. The, the leaders of the Population Council, you know, they knew that birth control was still a very controversial thing in the United States. And so they really leaned on the science of demography in order to, to legitimate their efforts to reduce population growth overseas. But they also wanted to keep what they were doing very quiet. And so, you know, at first they described themselves as kind of an, an educational organization, and they, were, they did not want to get the U.S. government involved at all. They wanted to work through the private sector. Meanwhile, another organization that was a little bit older, the Population Reference Bureau, was working very hard to shape American public opinion in favor of overseas population control. So the, the Population Reference Bureau was working really hard to, to make Americans worry about population growth overseas. And by the 1950s, the, the Population Reference Bureau was promoting the idea that population growth overseas would promote the spread of global communism and lead to nuclear war. And so it was, it was really this organization, the Population Reference Bureau, which was founded and staffed by the kinds of businessmen taking the Malthusian view of population growth that was really working to shape American public opinion and to put pressure on American lawmakers to incorporate population growth into U.S. foreign policy. And so as a result, the kinds of ideas that 
entered the American popular consciousness were these very expansive Malthusian ideas that population growth is, is a natural threat. Population growth anywhere in the world is a threat to Americans and to the world as a whole. Whereas the, the science was really working in a much more um, quiet and targeted way to promote population growth as a means of stimulating economic development. Now, as you describe later in the 1960s and the 1970s, that consensus came under criticism and began to fall apart. Who was criticizing the consensus you've described for us and what were their criticisms? So I described the consensus as a convergence or a working together of two perspectives, each of which had its own organization behind it. So we have the, the Population Council, which is behind the demographic perspective that population growth is a barrier to economic development. And then we have the Population Reference Bureau behind the more expansive view that population growth is just a threat to, to the world, a threat to global peace, that population growth promotes the spread of global communism, and that population growth will lead to nuclear war. And so in the, the last chapter of the book, I refer to these two, these two positions as they start to come apart. As, so on the one hand, the population establishment is the, the population council, the Ford Foundation, the demographers, and then the population bombers are the Population Reference Bureau, Paul Ehrlich, who, who writes the book, The Population Bomb, um, enters kind of on this side of, of the, the consensus. So even though there was a consensus between these two positions, they remained, at least to one another, distinguishable. So it may have looked to the American public that po the population movement it was one big thing, but within, within the population movement, these two positions remained distinguishable to one another. And in the 19, late 1960s and the beginning of the 1970s, they started to criticize one another. So the consensus starts getting critiqued really from within by these two positions that had never fully converged. So on the one hand, the, the population bombers, um, so that's the Population Reference Bureau, which now includes Paul Ehrlich and other, some other natural scientists like Garrett Hardin, uh, this group is really getting focused on the environmental consequences of population growth and still um, promoting population control as the, um, the only way to protect the, the earth from um, environmental degradation. And they critique the population establishment for not moving fast enough to slow population growth. So as I said before, the Population Council were working, they were working very quietly. They always promoted population control through voluntary family planning programs, or at least through family planning programs that they described as voluntary. And for the, the other half of this consensus, that wasn't enough. And by the end of the 1960s, the, these population bombers are starting to more vocally critique the population establishment for not not doing enough to slow population growth. On the other side, um, the members of the population establishment, and this is where most, most of the demographers are along with their funders, they became very critical of the population bombers for what the bombers were saying about the natural environment. So the, the population establishment, they are also concerned with environmental degradation, uh, but they actually don't see it as a result of population growth. They are much more concerned about kind of the direct effects of the growth of industry and specific changes that are happening in industry that lead to ever greater pollution. And they recognize that, that it's not a direct function of population growth. And so in their view, the population bombers are really exaggerating the dangers of population growth. And they also critique the population bombers for demanding what, what, uh, what the population establishment sees as coercive, coercive means of controlling population. So what the bombers want is really uh, legal limits on childbearing. They want the US government to regulate childbearing in the United States, and they want the, the US government to put pressure on governments in other countries to regulate childbearing. For the population establishment, um, they are very committed 
to what they see as, as voluntary family planning programs, except um, as I argue in the book, they, they define voluntary as just um, no legal limits. So, you know, anything shy of actually legislating who can have how many children, uh, they consider voluntary. But that does become a, a big source of tension between really the two halves of this of this consensus that comes out at the, the 1974 UN Population Conference. So the idea at the 1974 UN Population Conference is that all of the countries of the world, all of the UN member states, at least, will agree on a world population plan of action. And coming from the United States, there were really two factions, one of which was promoting countries establishing quantitative limits on their childbearing, and the other one that wanted to work through voluntary, what they called, again, voluntary family planning programs. But this consensus also had critics on the outside. And so the, the 1974 conference really provided a platform for these external critics to criticize both sides of the consensus. So to really criticize the whole idea that population growth was a problem that needed to be solved. And so these critics, many of them, or I guess this critique, uh, a lot of it began in independency theory among um, Latin American social scientists who really pointed out the flaws in the science, in the demographic science that had portrayed population growth as a as a threat to economic development, as a barrier to economic development. They, their voices, the voices of these dependency theorists were amplified actually by demography graduate students in the United States who took up these critiques and actually used them to, to criticize their, their own professors and mentors and uh, to critique the field that they were entering from within. But at the, at the 1974 UN Population Conference, by, by that point in time, the, the UN Conference on Trade and Development had articulated what was called a new international economic order, which were aimed to, to promote more equity between countries of primary production and industrial countries um, by changing the, the kind of terms of trade on which on which goods and mater raw materials and manufactured goods flowed around the world. And so it was at that conference that most countries in the global south kind of came together in opposition to population control as a, a necessary prerequisite to economic development. Emily, today worries about the environment and about population growth have not abated. And one of the themes that comes up in your histories of the emergence of the population consensus and the criticism of it is different attitudes towards regulation or redistribution as opposed to population control to solve problems. I wonder now what perspectives your history offers for our contemporary debates. So what I argue in the book is that our contemporary debates focus too much on what to do about the population problem without asking why we see population as a problem. And so what this book does is it, you know, by going through the history of the last hundred years, it explains how Americans in particular came to see population growth as the source of really large global problems, specifically socioeconomic inequality at the global level and uh, environmental degradation at the global level. And, you know, my hope is that by understanding how population growth came to take the blame for these problems and how population control got framed as the solution, that we can start to see around the population problem and to see that the, the problem is not necessarily population itself, but problems that are caused by, by maldistribution of resources that, that would more um, directly be solved by redistribution, problems that are caused by you know, the, the emissions of, of fossil fuels and, and other industrial products into the environment and could be more um, directly solved by regulations on 
um, what's being emitted into the environment, rather than these kind of roundabout solutions that, well, if there were fewer people, then there would be less emissions, or if there were fewer people, then there would be kind of more of everything to go around. And to really think about whose interests are promoted and whose interests are kind of denied by reframing these problems in terms of population. Great. Thank you, Emily, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. The book is Building the Population Bomb, published by Oxford University Press. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. You can find more resources for exploring this topic, other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect with our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts and the Rita Allen Foundation.